All right, I see that the Zoom room has opened up. That must mean it's nine o'clock on Wednesday morning. It's time for the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. We have a great program lined up this morning. We talk with Brandon Short. Uh, Brandon's a Penn State trustee. He's a former, uh, I, I can't say former, he's a current Penn State letterman. Uh, Penn State Letterman, All-American, captain of uh, the football team, has gone on to a great career in business. We're going to talk to Brandon Short in just a couple minutes. As always, let us know who you are and where you're from in the chat. I see Paul McConaughey beating me to the punch in Cape Cod and Randy Houston in Englewood, New Jersey. I see Ed and Pat Nicolano in Sea Isle City, New Jersey. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll be getting started here in just a minute. Wyatt Troxel, I assume Wyatt's uh, tuning in from Lewisburg, Pennsylvania this morning. Good morning to you, Wyatt and Lewisburg and Max Morlock in Pittsburgh. And to all those who are on Facebook Live, welcome to you all as well. Yes, the 81st president of the Penn State Alumni Association, Randy Houston joining us from New Jersey this morning. Good to see you, Randy. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? My name is Paul Clifford. I'm the CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association and welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they are passionate about. And you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. We are recording this session and closed captions are available for this event. You can find information in the chat or in the chat in Zoom or in the comments on Facebook about how you can activate your closed caption for this event. While we are talking with Brandon Short this morning, Brandon is the M&A Director at Round Hill Capital where he leads inorganic growth strategies for the firm and manages corporate level debt and equity financings. Brandon has over 11 years experience in real estate, investment banking, and investment management. Before Round Hill, Brandon was a member of the Cerebus European uh, real estate investment team. Before Cerebus, he was with Goldman Sachs as a real estate investment banker based in New York City and Dubai. Uh, he currently serves as a member of the board of trustees here at Penn State. And before his career in finance, Brandon had a seven year career in the National Football League with the Carolina Panthers and New York Giants. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Marketing from Penn State. He also went on to receive his MBA from Columbia Business School. Please welcome Brandon Short to Coffee Hour. Good morning, Brandon. Good morning, Paul. Thanks, thanks for having me. We should probably change this to tea time, right? You're, you're in London. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah. afternoon there. Maybe, maybe we should be uh pinkies up with it with the spot of tea uh but yeah yeah <laughs> we, we, we are five hours ahead and it's it's a lot you know culturally different over here you know in london relative to you know what you know like that being back at home in pennsylvania people have a spot of tea as opposed to having a beer so that takes that's taken a little while to get used to <laughs> absolutely hey, yeah. let's let's start right at the very beginning you were recruited yeah. to penn state by legendary coach joe paterno how did you become yeah. a nittany lion uh, that's a great question, and it was sort of the, the, the road less traveled. You know, I, I grew up in Keysport, Pennsylvania, which is outside Pittsburgh, and, and like most people in Pittsburgh, you know, I was a Steelers, Pirates, and Penguins fans, and, you know, I, I realize this is a four-letter word around here, but, you know, in my youth and ignorance, I was actually a Pitt fan and, wow. and, and hated Penn State, so I was a, Pitt, a Penn State hater, um, but my grandmother, the woman who raised me, you know, heard about Joe and heard that, you know, he cared about his players' development as human beings as much um, as he cared about their development as athletes. And um, she demanded that I look at Penn State. I can still remember her saying that, you know, this this Joe character reminds me a lot of me. Right. I, I got to get I got a good kick out of that. Um, so. Uh, we go up to Penn State, my grandmother and I, um, for, you know, our first game. And we arrived midway through um, the first quarter. And I can remember everyone being so nice to me, even though um, they didn't even know that I was a recruit. So we go to our seats, we sit down, and we hear that we are Penn State chant for the first time. 
And then, as you know, after we say we are Penn State three times, we say, thank you, you're welcome. And I'm going to say the Penn State had my grandmother at thank you. <laughs> so yeah, pro so proper manners, right? Proper manners, yep, with like a spot of tea. Yeah. <laughs> but but after the game, we, we go over to Joe's house and you know, we I, I sit down at his kitchen table. And like I remember Joe saying to me, if you want glory, like you can go to a place that has names on the back of their jerseys or has decals on her helmet. But if you want greatness, you got to come to Penn State. And that even though we don't have names on the back of our jerseys, he said, I can guarantee you by the end of every game, everybody will know exactly who you are. I commit it right there. So that, that, that's how I came to Penn State. That's awesome. So you come to Penn State, you start playing for, for Coach Paterno. Uh, how was Penn State, how was Penn State different? Oh, uh, let, 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 let me count the ways. Um, it was different in so many ways, but the main difference is that it, it had a, a family atmosphere. And, you know, and like we, we, you know, set a standard to be excellent in everything we do and not even apply it to, to being off the field. Um, we have the highest graduation rate of any, you know, top 25 team. And it was basically because of the way that Joe ran the program. Um, that one thing, like, for example, there, there's something that we used to call Joe time, meaning that if, you know, a meeting started at five o'clock, you know, that you would have to be in that meeting by 445 or you could or you could literally miss the whole meeting. My first meeting at Penn State, the meeting started at five o'clock. I showed up at 455. Everybody was in their seats. Joe was in the middle of giving a speech. And um, he yelled at me, he's like, sure, if, you don't, if you're not on time, you'll never play here. I, was, I looked at my watch and looked up and I was like, am, am I in the twilight zone? Because no one had really, it, it, they, they said be early and I was early, but I didn't know I had to be 15 minutes early. But, but uh, another thing is that we did that was unique, um, it was breakfast, right? That, that he like, thought breakfast was the most important meal of the day. So he demanded that everybody wake up and check into breakfast even if they didn't have class. And it was in, and talking to Joe, like, it was actually his way to, he didn't want people laying in the bed. He wanted people to be motivated. So he had somebody checking us in at breakfast every morning. And if we didn't get there, we didn't go to breakfast. It was like, you missed practice. And then, and then sort of a, a third, and this is like, if you missed class, there, there was no way you were playing. Like Joe had spies that would come and check people when they went when they would go to class. And like after practice, if you were in trouble, it was he would say, like, Johnson, you missed your biology class. You know, you'll never play here. You're letting your teammates down. So that, that's how we created this culture of just being excellent at, at everything we do. It was just these little things that we did that like I still carry with me today. Now, one of the great traditions at Penn State is. Um, is, is keeping our lettermen involved. Uh, and, and you have certainly been back in terms of your service to Penn State as a trustee. Do you see similarities between Coach Franklin and, and the current program to the program that you played in? I mean, they're, um, well, they look different. They talk different. It's a different era. But there are so many similarities when that from me being integrally involved in you know my, my own era and then like spending time with some of some of the guys today, you know under under Coach Franklin you know it's a family atmosphere. I'm sure people you hear him pre, like tweet like Penn State. No, we are family. We are right. family. And there's that commitment to excellence in, in academics. You know that you know we still have that one of the highest graduation rates. People. Um, graduating with over 3.0 GPAs and you know he, he cares about his players and their development in every aspect of life you know like one thing specifically that, that they do um, is they, they all the players when you come to Penn State like they, they help you put together a resume so that you're always thinking about the next phase in life and that might not seem like much but that's we didn't do that you know back when I, when I played they didn't have a, make resumes for us and every year they have this annual uh, career fair where they bring big business in and they, they help the, the, the guys work with their interview skills to try to, the, to get them prepared for that next phase of life. And in terms of, of, of classes, I'm not close enough to the program to know if James has spies, but I know that, that he shows up to at least four classes a year randomly that has clusters of students. And, and let me tell you, you know, I wouldn't want to be the guy who didn't show up to that class. 
know, it's like exactly. I, I, I mentor a bunch of the kids. And for me, like us, like Jesse Lucetta, Shane Simmons, Micah Parsons, these are all like good kids. Everything is yes, sir. No, sir. You know, I appreciate you. And I know that they want to have an impact on the world. So for me, as a letterman, it's great to see that bridge that there's success with honor and, and you know, 2020. At version 2020, the, the, with social media and all the, the things that we have to address today, but is, there's still that core principle of on and off the field success. Absolutely. Hey, we ask Letterman when they when they come on coffee hour to share their favorite Joe Paterno story. And so I'm going to put you on the spot and ask if you might yeah. share your favorite Joe story. I mean, there there were so many. I don't think I had to have to think about this, but where to begin? But I guess my, one of my, my favorite Joe stories, like Joe used to, you know, always like to make us feel like we were underdogs, and they would just make him nervous whenever you know we were ahead or we were favored. And you know, in in, in 1998, you know, we we were the number one team um, in the country, and we went to Louisville, and they were on the road, and they were the number eight team in the country. And look, Paul, let me tell you, this was the most excellent Penn State football half I have ever been associated with in terms of our play. Um, we ran the ball up and down the field, scored almost every time we touched it. And they didn't, they didn't, they basically got three first downs on us. So, but before the end of the half, Curtis Enos had the ball, Curtis Enos was on his way running for basically another touchdown and like fumble. And okay, we like we stop them and we end the, the half up 50 to nothing is the score. 50 0. So we get into the locker room and we're all sitting there and we're, and we're still focused, but we're a little loose. And uh, and Joe comes in and he's yelling at us, like you special teams, we should have pinned them deep. We didn't pin them deep on the punt. Like defense, they shouldn't have got that first down. They're yelling at us. And, and at offense, like like you, like Enos, like if you if you fumble the ball, you'll never play here. And we're sitting there looking around, and all of a sudden, I, I'm not going to say who the player is. Somebody says, "Joe, are you looking at the same game we're looking at?" And, and everybody in the locker room laughs. And he looked. He went to go after the guy, and he paused, and he smiled, and he looked at Enos and said, "Hold on to the ball," and just walked out. <laughs> uh, that is that is a great story. I haven't heard that one before. That one's fantastic. Yeah. Mr. Penn this is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by Brandon Short, Penn State trustee, All-American, international business magnate. So you graduate from Penn State in 1999 with a degree in marketing, and you were the fourth yes. round pick uh, by the New York Giants. You know, other shows are going to talk about big games and key plays, but I'm more interested in hearing about the power of the Penn State network and what that was, what that was like from the NFL perspective. Well, well, just to be clear, we are the largest, most active alumni association in the world. We have over over seven hundred thousand, you know, alumni. And my wife, all and everywhere I go in the world, and I've been all around, like D Dubai, you know, like he living here in London. We see Penn Staters, and we have that pride. And so, you know, as a, as terms of the NFL, you know, it, it it's no different. You know, we have a large alum, alumni network within the NFL, so we we always have a lot of NFL players, and we are and we're all we're really tight together. And you know, one of the things that we always do is so we're 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 humble, but we're confident. There's no doubt about it. And we and, and we always sort of make bets with other guys about you know when they play Penn State and. So, and the biggest bet is wearing Penn State gear and then like posting something or sharing it with um, friends and family, which is much worse than giving somebody money because it's, it, it's you know, our, our pride. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's it's always great to see the pictures after the game of Penn Staters on, on opposing teams getting together and exchanging the jerseys or getting that picture, uh, that picture with each, each other. I know you played with several Penn Staters during your time. I know your time um, overlap with Kerry Collins uh, and, and playing on uh, on the same team as him, and it's it's just always oh. great to see um, see those connections. I, I know you're an Eagles fan, so don't hate on the Giants, please. <laughs> and there's probably a lot of Eagles fan on the line. We used to own you when we played, guys. Just remember. Oh, we beat, we beat the, we beat the Eagles nine straight times. Nine, the Giants, we, nine straight we'd times. We have to go back and look at that. History. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> 
So you play seven years, seven seasons in the NFL with New York and Carolina, and then you go back to school, right? You go back and you earn your MBA from Columbia. Walk us through your career following the time in the NFL uh, to where you are today. Yeah. And, you know, something that was always you know, instilled is that, you know, you and me, you know, at Penn State, by uh, you know, Joe and uh, Tom Bradley, you know, some of the other really, you know, key forceful leaders on that, um, that staff is that you always have to have the ability um, to see past your nose and see like and look, you know, far out in front of you and that every um, football player will be a former football player and you have to leverage your life and that, that in football that people may want to be around you and, you know, that, and you can learn from people to set yourself up for the next stage. And, and, and that's what I did. You know, I didn't, didn't want the best life years of my life to be behind me when I was 30 and sort of needed that refinement of, uh, of another, you know, secondary education. Um, I would have went to Penn State, but uh, I was in New York, so I ended up going to Columbia. Right. And, you know, and, you know, going into to business school from not really having um, sort of being in, sitting in front of a desk it, it is extremely challenging. And, you know, you're in there, you're competing against the best people in the, in the world. But, you know, my experience at Penn State you know, hard work, discipline, you know, really, really helped me during that transition. And then from college to pros, you know, I had the support of Penn State alumni in Letterman, you know, guys like John Schaefer, you know, who worked at Goldman Sachs, mentor, mentored me, you know, um, Scott Gobb, Tim Freeman. So we had a large segment of guys that were on Wall Street and they saw me and they just brought me in, like Matt Johnson at Barclays, these are all senior people that, you know, that run parts of those banks or parts of those organizations. And that mentorship and guidance, you know, like without that, you know, I might not have got the job at Goldman Sachs in New York or gone to Dubai or moved over to Cerberus or, you know, had my, my own business or be an M&A director here at Roundhill. So that those Penn State connections, um, you know, really, really helped me during sort of that, that sort of fulcrum point phase when I didn't know what I was going to do. But seeing those guys made me feel like I can do it, which is why I feel the responsibility to do that for, you know, Shane Simmons. He's my guy. You know, see him today. He's making his transition into professional life and the sky is the limit. You know, he's probably a lot smarter and tougher than me. And if I can do it, then I'm sure he can, too, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Shane, Shane's a fan favorite, uh, comes from great family. Uh, and, and we're sad to see him, see him leave the program, but we're also excited to see what he goes out and does and how he makes an impact on the world. He's going to take it over. Trust me. My money's <laughs> on him. <laughs> Absolutely. So after your time at Goldman Sachs, you turned the entrepreneurial route. You co-found World Business Partners at UAE, uh, a Middle East uh, lender specializing in loans for small and medium-sized companies. Did you always know you wanted to start your own business or was it an opportunity that presented itself and you took advantage of the opportunity? Well, I mean, as an athlete, you're, I'm always, the, I'm a competitor and, you know, always want to try, I'm striving to be the best and I'm looking at, at, at what you know people that i admire and i see and i want to get there and it's the people that all sort of own their own funds or have their own business or start something and as you know that athlete like all sports is is really taking calculated risk right. and pattern recognition as a linebacker you see you see patterns and then you put yourself in position you know to make a play to anticipate what's going to happen and you you undercut you know that tight end running a route, you jump the route because you've studied and you made plays. And that's the only way you're going to get that touchdown and take it back. So I look at it as the same way. It is that look, that that was a, a calculated risk that I was able that, you know, to that I wanted to be able to go out and for my own business to, to grow and develop. So it, it's a combination of both that, you know, I saw the, I had the opportunity, but it's I'm always looking for, you know, the, to, to try to, to, to maximize value. So uh, lending in the Middle East is, is somewhat unique. There, there are restrictions. Talk a little bit about the intersection between, uh, between Islam and, and how your country or how your company operates. Well, I mean, the, the, it, it, there's, there's Sharia compliant lending, meaning that technically you're not, there's not supposed to be, you have interest, but there, there, so, but there are structures around that. So if, if anything is secured by an asset, 
you have a, a predetermined contract to pay back a certain amount of money. It's not interest, but it's 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 effective. It acts like interest. So if there's a house, a car, uh, anything that's asset backed, you 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 can go out and lend against it. Just one of the things that you you can't do is necessarily just have for like lines of credit unless you go out and do something that's a little bit complex structure sort of to like borrow you have to borrow gold and lend again and then like have a pre-determined contract so there there are there are financial structures that you can that you need to go and you can mitigate that and and have you know a tremendous opportunity lending um, in a Sharia compliant way so uh 2018 you were elected to the board of trustees what are some of the most pressing topics on the BOT agenda, uh, uh, listen. There, there, there are pressing topics, and there are many of them. But there, there's one that is that stands out above all others. And then we talk about it, and we fight like tooth and nail about it. You know, every meeting is affordability, affordability, affordability. You know, the cost to attend Penn State is, is skyrocketing, and it's a national problem that 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 cost because the 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 that costs are, are increasing, but that doesn't excuse Penn State for because it's a national problem. Our goal is to outperform the nation and come up with solutions to address that issue of affordability. You know, 51, 52,000 a year, you know, for out of state, for like room and board, you know, 37,000 for, for, for in-state. It's our job to provide affordable education and upward mobility through education for the citizens of Pennsylvania and for our alumni around the world. And it, it is, you know, something that every decision that we make comes back to that affordability. But uh, another point that, 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 that is top of mind is sort of the future of education. Yeah. How um, will we do education in a post-COVID environment? Where there, there can be uh, there could be new pandemics and new challenges facing. We were already thinking about the shift to more of an online platform by building out the World Campus, which is the top online education that you can get in the country, arguably the world. No, in the world because the U.S. has the best secondary education in the world. Right. So the, the World Campus is the top education you can get online in the world. So we had we were building that infrastructure and thinking about that shift. So now with with you know this with Zoom and sort of these online classes, you we can have professors that live in Beijing. They can they can teach you know our our classes you know in state college. Even if you want to have pe people in, in person, or we can do things at home. So we need to like rethink sort of you know where we're we're building and how we're building the the our infrastructure to address what education is going to look like in the future. So last year. Uh, President Barron formed the Task Force on Racism, Bias, and Community Safety. Um, you were named the chair of the Board of Trustees Oversight Group um, around that committee. What is the oversight role and, and how does the BOT effort support the work of the University Task Force on these issues? Well, President Barron commissioned um, the, the um, Racism Task Force back in June. You know, after the horrific murder of George Floyd and, you know, other really terrible, violent acts uh, uh, of racism to address racism, you know, at Penn State. And he formed the, like multiple, the, the his select commission, um, sort of, and, and police, university policing, um, you know, a, a, a committee within the faculty senate looking at adapting classes and adapting the student code of conduct. He, he formed these different groups and gave them a broad mandate to come back independently of board interference or interference from the administration with their recommendations on how to pr uh, how to improve racism. But one thing that we that we that we needed, and that President Barron asked for, is like pr President Barron was overseeing the project, but he needed someone to over have oversight of him. And one of the main roles that we had is that that oversight. So we we have 15 meetings, um, and they were on a weekly basis. And for um, the first half, it was an hour meeting. We would talk to the individual heads of those um, sector groups, where we would you know ensure that they had the resources they needed, or help them navigate through um, the bureaucracy. But for the second half of that meeting, we had administrators, you know, come to us and talk to us about um, the issues that they faced on campus. 
you know, the women, people of color, people, you know, that were that were, were Jewish or Muslim, they would all come in and just talk about the challenges they faced, like in, in with no, no diversity. And like for it for me, you know, it it um I don't I don't want to say it was eye-opening because I like the, the reality is, you know, I experienced a lot of these, these things myself, but for a lot of our committee, you know, it, it was eye-opening and it it really helped people rethink and reshape the way that they are are governing at the university and in their private businesses. You know, I, I had a, a trustee tell me, a good friend, he said, man, like Brandon, I had no idea that most black people were afraid of the cops. And I was like, man, like, look, just dude, that's basic black. <laughs> for, for better or for worse, it's like that's something that you were taught when we're very young. And uh, 10 and 2 when you're you're in a car. Um, so that, that I felt that that element, you know, was extremely valuable in addition to the, the, the oversight that, that we provided uh, air. So it's, it's an oversight role, but that doesn't mean that the Board of Trustees is actually a, a passive observer on these efforts. Um, you've been active in terms of making commitments to diversify the board as well as um, redefine a committee to focus on de and Can you talk about some of the board level commitments yeah. uh, that have been made on around this? Well, 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 first that it's, you know, we we need more diversity on our board, not just that diversity of, of race and gender, but more that diversity of ideas. You know, I, I'm the only African-American on Penn State's board currently, and I'm the second youngest member of the board. And you know, we, you know, the board, you know, has made a commitment to make the, the board 50% diverse, you know, by 2025. Um, and when we say diverse, that includes women, that includes people of the Jewish faith or the Muslim faith, but to work to try to add, when people roll off of the board in the positions that are appointed, to try to bring people that have more diverse mindset and that they come from a diverse set of backgrounds on. Um, we also, you know, committed to, to having unconscious bias training. Part of what, what the, our committee did is we recommended that, made recommendations to the board, and we have that unconscious bias training. And we had an unconscious bias training back, our first one, you know, back in November, and we're still trying to determine whether we're going to do that on a semi-annual or an annual basis, but that is going to, to be a core part. And, you know, something that when I took that training, you know, I realize that we're all biased. People from all religions, all races or backgrounds, you make snap decisions about people without, you know, sometimes digging in. And when you do that, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage because you're not looking at what's really there. And it leads to making better decisions. Um, the third thing that we did is we, we created a new uh, committee um, of equity and HR. And um, this committee is like is now Perry Passu with finance, audited risk, outreach, legal, um, as a, as a way to sort of prioritize the issue of diversity and inclusion at the university. And this this um, committee's job is to to oversee you know the um, diversity and inclusion initiatives um, throughout the university, um, and to oversee the board's diversity over it. So we, it's it's oversight of our of ourselves to make sure we're hitting our goals and we're attaining the things. Um, that, that we need to do. This summer, you served on, on a webinar titled Toward Racial Equity at Penn State, Social Difference, Social Equity, and Social Change. And during that session, you shared, um, you shared that you, and, and I'm quoting, uh, nearly had a panic attack when you realized that my teammate and I were the only black people in a class with 300 students. Yeah. Um, you said that resources and support afforded to you as a member of the football team were a major factor in your success at Penn State, but that you watched some of your um, African-American classmates struggle without those resources. So what, what resources can the university provide to make the biggest impact? I think the biggest thing we can do is, is provide mentorship. I mean, it, it like, starting college is difficult for people from any race or any background. And you're going through that freshman year, you're trying to take classes, you're trying to organize your schedule, um, and you're on your own. Nobody is helping you do that. And, you know, for some people have, you know, financial difficulties and, and stress, but if, 
you know, you are a person that may be coming from, be a first generation student, you may not have someone that has been through it, a mother, a father, a cousin that can tell you, look, this is normal. What you're doing, like it, you feel like it's you're, it's crushing you. I felt that same way too. So beyond that, I, 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 one of the biggest things that we can do is provide that mentorship to try to give students an outlet or people to go speak to where they can just talk to them about maybe not being able to pay their bills or that they can be wealthy minorities and then not really fitting in and not like, what, what do you do when you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Just somebody to lean on. The, the, the reason why you need sort of diverse people and people like in, in positions of leadership is so people can say, I can do that too. You know, the, just the other day, there's the, the, you know, we were watching the, the television and, and Kamala Harris, you know, came on and she, like, I, like, I married um, a Pakistani American. So my, like literally, and, and Kamala Harris is a- African American and, and, and Indian American. And like, she looked up at the television and said, oh, like, who is that? Was like, that's Kamala Harris. She's like the most second powerful, most second most powerful person in the world and she, and she said oh I want to be like her and my like I almost started crying and and because I was like you know what you, you you're going to be better than her so that's what people need to see sort of that type of example yeah you know um I, I'm going to ask uh, and I'll forget I'll understand if you don't want to go in this direction but when we talked last week on the phone you mentioned and you mentioned it a little earlier that racism and bias is something that not not something that you face incident by incident when it happens, but something that you face every single day. Um, recently, our community has been attacked by some well-documented document, Zoom bombing incidents. What can be done to support members of the BIPOC and LGBTQ communities when we see them subjected to racism and homophobia? Well, dealing with all issues of race are about recognizing their, there's a problem being open for change and holding people accountable. Um, I'm gonna come to the, the, the part that, you know, we need to be focusing on, but I, am, I was livid, you know, when, when I heard that. Um, I can't tell you how frustrated I was. And I just want to assure the Penn State community, accountability will be had. That we're, we're working to find these people and hold them, first of all, accountable as a deterrent not to do those things again. Now, you know, I'll, I'll get into the, what we can do for, for the students. You know, that, that my, I had an opportunity to talk to some of the people involved and I'm not gonna share what happened, specifics, but it was reprehensible. And, you know, a lot of that, you know, is what we need to do to help people that have experienced those things is to provide them with mental health outlets. You know, somewhere where they can go and they can talk to people. Um, we have to make sure that, you know, people, you know, feel safe on campus. So first and foremost, we have to like deal with and address that safety issue. And, you know, look, if, if we, they, we, it takes a village, right? We need the support of every faculty and staff member to, to, to recognize that these issues are occurring and, and maybe lend a hand, you know, and reach out and, and try to help support, you know, our underrepresented communities. So what can, what can alumni do to support these efforts? I mean, it, 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 it starts with us as individuals. You know, uh, they, 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 you, you can come back, be involved with the university in the same way that you do, and that you're great, you're great at getting people I, I, involved, Paul. But the reality is, it starts with us and as individuals. And if you see something, if you see racism, if you see homophobia, uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, you address it, say something. I and mean, it makes people like people are uncomfortable when you see things, you know, it, it cannot be acceptable. So what, what, what I would suggest, I mean, we continue to be involved in the university, you know, giving back, giving our time, talent and treasure to the university, like we all do, which we can do more, but it starts with, with us. And if you see some of these issues, address it and, and people let people know that we're, we're not going to accept this. Yeah, I was, I was talking with fellow Londoner, uh, John Amici, about this topic, yep. uh, a fellow, fellow Penn Stater as, as well. And, and John says it doesn't have to be this kind of big dramatic 
um, you know, kind of embarrassing of somebody who has taken a misstep, right? Uh, a yep. lot of times it's a, it's an interruption. It's a, um, you know, l- let me, let me stop you so that I completely understand and kind of redirect the conversation. Um, and, and so it, it, you know, sometimes it requires you standing in between people and sometimes yep. it's, it's the subtle redirection of a, of a conversation or, or of an incident. Um, that, that we all have the responsibility to, to step in on behalf of um, fellow Penn Staters, fellow, fellow human beings, right? When we, when we see injustice. Yeah. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by All-American uh, and international business magnate, Brandon Short. Brandon, we'd like to have a little bit of fun here okay. on Coffee Hour. So I'm going to ask you some quick hitter questions. I see we have some questions coming in from the audience as well that we'll get to. Uh, but let, let's let's talk about your favorite Penn State memory. I mean, there's so many favorite memories, but there's, there's so many memories. But I, you know what? My favorite individual memory is there was a, a, a snowball battle between Mifflin Hall <laughs> And, and, and like East Halls, and it was a, an awesome snowball battle where there were literally like 700 people, like 350 on each side having this, this battle, like it was like a medieval like, war game. And I, I think about all the, like, the, all the experience being on the hub lawn when the spring breaks and, you know, playing Frisbee, you know, you know like spending time, you know, on, on, on campus, all those things. But, but when I think about it, what remind water battles with, with people, but that, that snowball battle was probably my, my favorite memory. And it, it is a, encompassed a lot of things that I love about the school. How about your favorite class at Penn State? I think it was sociology 101. And it was because it's, it's because I, I came from sort of an inner city environment and as you, you mentioned I had sort of a difficult time, you know, transitioning and it was just listening, you know, to people's diff- different points of views and, and getting into to debates about issues of um, social justice, um, you know, issues around family, real, talking about really sensitive points. And it was at that point, you know, it may, I realized that, you know, I had a voice. And did like I, I had a perspective and was able to sort of make a, a, a point where you know was we could you know actually convince somebody to change their point of view and and, and it was that class being in it specifically and Gabe Tincher was a was a offensive lineman that was in it in the class with me as well and we came from completely different backgrounds we used to have these awesome debates but at the end we'd always hug it out and and come out stronger for it. So if you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? Living, I'm gonna have to say Barack Obama. And I I say Barack Obama because, you know, like he achieved a height in in public service. And maybe someday, you know, when I grow up, I may wanna consider doing the same. And he's also sort of a, a minority as well. And I just would really love to sit and pick his brain about, you know, like how, he got into this why and what how he navigated to to you know make the biggest impact possible it's interesting uh if you're into listening to podcasts he is now doing a brand new podcast with bruce springsteen so it's bruce springsteen and barack obama hosting a podcast together to talk about um to talk about uh, issues within our country uh i have not tuned into it yet i've heard commercials for it but it's certainly something on my must listen list how about um, your most unusual we are moment? You talked about traveling in the Middle East and, and in London, kind of the unusual or unexpected place that you heard we are. Like the, I was in, um, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and you know, like walking up the street and you know, I had on like my, a Penn State like sweatshirt, like I, like I, like I normally do every day. And, and we're, 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 we're riding, we're walking along and we're walk, going into our hotel room and then somebody rides past and yells, we are. And I turned and said, oh my gosh, I, like I didn't, I didn't even get a chance to say <laughs> Penn State. They, they, they just, they just like, just said we are as they rode by. And I just walked away like, man, Penn State. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. How about, let's say besides football, What's your favorite Penn State sport? 
uh, it, 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 it's got to be wrestling. You know, Coach Sanders and, and, and that wrestling team, they are dominant. And I love to see how, you know, they the hard work and discipline and the effort that they put in and how they represent the university. You know, I, I, I love that. I, I would have wrestled if, you know, I could have. <laughs> I'm afraid that somebody, one of those guys might pin me down and, 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 and break something. But, um, you know, I, I really like the wrestling. There's I'm a number of sports. I like, I like women's basketball and volleyball as well. So uh, I'm, trying, the, the, I'm trying to think if you, and, and I might get this wrong, but if you and Carrie McCoy were, um, were in school together, that would, that would be one heck of a wrestling match. No, 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 it wouldn't. Have. I, I would use, <laughs> the, I would use my strategic, my advantage over him. I'm fast and I would run. Let me tell you, oh, I would okay. dip. I can't, I can't let that guy get his hands on me uh, or, or I have to stick and move. I'm not going to play him at that game. So no, I would not win that. That's funny. I, I, thought we were, I thought we were about to set up a pay per view between you and and Kerry McCoy. That would be. That would be I've, I've gotten wise in my old age, Paul. You know, the, the, these grades. That's what they. Uh, you know, let's let, let's 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 play another game here. That's funny. <laughs> um, and the final question: What is your favorite flavor of Creamery ice cream? Of course, it is Peachy Paterno. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you gotta love it. <laughs> Ab- absolutely, absolutely. So um, a couple questions coming in um, about uh, other building projects. We know about the, the Lash building project that was just, uh, that was just approved, uh, but we have some fans who are wondering when, when Beaver Stadium is going to be on, on the docket uh, to make it more, uh, more fan friendly, right? With bathrooms and concessions. Uh, I know Sandy Barber has talked about this, that it's part of the, um, part of the master plan uh, to to upgrade Beaver Stadium, but anything you want to say about that? Yeah, I mean it 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 is, and and the, we're we're aware that that Beaver Stadium needs to be upgraded. And as we're talking about spending, you know, we talked about you know, we we did a we did uh, we passed some spending um, a few weeks ago. You know, that all plays in, as Sandy mentioned, to our our master plan. So we're aware that you know that we need to address, you know, what's happening over at the stadium. And, you know, it, it, it's a part of the plan. Now, in terms of timing, that is a question on sort of the sources of funding. You know, we're, we're looking at a, you know, combination of going out and having, you know, philanthropy and a combination of debt. We would like to have more philanthropy than, than the, than the latter. So, you know, that, that, you know, is a big question and we're, we're currently working through it. Great. Well, Brandon, I want to thank you for joining us on Coffee Hour this morning. It's always great to catch up with you, um, but it's always it's it's inspiring to hear about uh, the work that you're leading here at Penn State as well. The the task force on racism, bias, and community safety is important. It's one that we all have a responsibility around making a contribution to, and and I'm grateful for the work that you're doing on that. Well, thank you, Paul. Really appreciate you. Really appreciate, you know, you, you know, know, giving me an opportunity to come speak to you. And, you know, this, that we're onward and upward at Penn State. We're waking up every day thinking about how to make this university better and working our tails off for you. Absolutely. Well, thanks for being a guest. And I want to thank everyone who's tuning in on Facebook Live and right here in the Zoom room. If you're a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. If not, what are you waiting for? Go out on our, to our website and join at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thanks for all you do for the university, for the glory and for the future. We are Penn State.